Question 51. A firm reported the following. We've got cash flow from operations, interest expense, capital expenditure, and the tax rate. What is the company's free cash flow to the firm? So we're going to be using our free cash flow to the firm formula, starting with cash flow from operations, since that's what we've been given here. Um, so we'll, we're given all the information, so it's a matter of just kind of plugging these in and getting our output. So CFO is our cash flow from operations, a million dollars. We're going to add back that interest expense uh, multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate. So we'll do 1 minus 0.33 times that 150000 and then we subtract out our capital expenditures, which is just given as 250. So pulling that in here... Uh, we see that gets us to 850500 and we'll go with answer B. So on the exam and in general, you're going to be asked to calculate free cash flow to the firm or free cash flow to equity with, you know, potentially different starting numbers. So we've had questions where you start from CFO, cash flow from operations. You have questions where you start from net income. It's really best to just have flashcards for each of these different starting points um, and then kind of remember what the what needs to be added back or subtracted out from there based on that starting point. Um, so that would be my advice there. Question 52. ABC Company has a net income of $11 million from January 1st, 2016 to December 31st, 2016. On January 1st, 2016, it had 1 million shares outstanding, and the company bought back 200,000 shares on October 1st, 2016. ABC's earnings per share for the fiscal year of 2016 is closest to. So we're going to be using our basic uh, EPS formula for this problem here. Um, so we've got net income minus preferred dividends. We're given our net income of 11 million. Uh, it doesn't say anything about preferred dividends here, so we can go ahead and ignore that. Um, and then the uh, where we'll have to do a little extra work here is on the weighted average number of shares outstanding. Um, so we've got 1 million shares outstanding from January 1st to October 1st, so for nine months. And then when the company buys back 200,000 shares, that means that we have, we're subtracting from this 1 million and that brings us to 800,000. So we'll have 800,000 shares for three of the 12 months. And so to calculate that weighted average number of shares, we're just going to be taking the weighted average, as it says. So uh, we had 1 million shares for nine of the 12 months. Um, and then we add that to 800,000 times three of the 12 months gives us a weighted average of 950,000. So we've got our net income of 11 million over 950,000. Uh, which is going to give us our basic EPS of 11.5789, and we can round that up and do take answer C. Question 53. AVGI is an American company reporting under IFRS. I like that. Its inventory has been bought for $16 million and is predicted to be sold for $31 million. If the net realizable value is 18 million, inventories should be shown on the balance sheet at. So, highlighted IFRS because that's normally going to be important whether we're distinguishing between IFRS and GAAP. Under IFRS, um, they were required to measure at the lower of either cost, so what we bought it for, so we bought for 16 million, or the at uh, net realizable value. So net realizable value is 18 million cost is 16 million we take the lower of those two um, numbers and that's what we're going to show our inventory at on the balance sheet so we will be showing at 16 million and i think as we mentioned before um, we're doing this because the standards really don't want companies to be overstating what their inventory is worth question 54 which of the following most likely has an impact on revenue recognition so we've got a change in credit limits, a change in delivery terms, or a change in payment terms with customers. So if you look at the answer on the Analyst Prep website, um, you'll, you'll get all the technical definitions of, rec of uh, revenue recognition under GAAP and under IFRS. Um, but 
in its simplest terms, revenue recognition is going to be when um, the work for which we've been paid is completed or when the goods that we've been paid for are delivered. And so in that, with that in mind, it's essentially um, when the work is done. And so let's take a look at these. A, a change in credit limits. This doesn't really, ha this doesn't have anything to do with um, how or when we're completing the work. It just might, uh, this is more going to just depend on when the cash is coming in the door, um, whether that's sooner or later. A change in delivery terms. This certainly could impact revenue recognition if we're um, delivering items later, whether the, if this is a good um, or sooner, we're going to be able to recognize that revenue either faster or slower based on the delivery. Or if we're delivering a service over multiple different um, points of the engagement, then that's also going to change when we're able to recognize our revenue. So B is probably going to be our answer. Let's just make sure we can rule out C. A change in payment terms with the customers. Um, kind of similar to A, this is just kind of changing around when the cash is coming in or out of the business. Um, not necessarily important for rec revenue recognition. So we'll stick with B. Question 55. An analyst has gathered the following information about a specific company. So we've got some balance sheet information here. We've got cash, accounts receivable, inventory on the assets side, and then we've got accounts payable and taxes payable on the liability side. If the industry has a current ratio of 3.4, we can most likely conclude that. So we're going to need to calculate this company's um, current ratio and then compare it to the industry, it sounds like. So our answers are the company is as liquid as its industry, the company is less liquid, or the company is more liquid, um, all compared to that 3.4 industry number. So that in mind, let's bring in the current ratio formula. So our current ratio formula is current assets over current liabilities. And so the what this is also telling us with the assets in the numerator, um, the if this number is higher or if the liabilities are lower, this is going to lead to a bigger current ratio, which means that um, if uh, the higher the number, the more liquid. So that's going to be important for our final answer here. So that in mind, let's uh, pull in our answer here. So our current assets are going to be all three of these that are given. So cash is a current asset, accounts receivable is a current asset, and inventory is a current asset. So we'll be adding all those up for our numerator, and then accounts payable and taxes payable are both um, current liabilities. So that brings us to a current ratio of 3.28, which is less than the industry. And as we just mentioned, higher number equals more liquid, so we're less liquid than the industry. Um, so A, as liquid, cross that off. B, less liquid compared to the industry. That'll be our answer. And C, more liquid, cross that off as well. We'll go with B. Question 56. The financial statements of a small company show the following accounts at the end of the year 2016. So we've got a few assets here for uh, property, plant, and equipment, accounts receivable and inventory, and then two liabilities, bond issued at 7% and current liabilities. The bond was issued, uh, we've got two notes down here for the financial statements. The bond was issued in 2016. Interest due on the bond has neither been paid nor recorded in the books yet. And the second note, values of inventories and accounts receivable are the same. You can verify that up here. Um, just under 130000 Given the information, the financial leverage for the firm is closest to. So we'll pull in our uh, financial leverage formula here. Uh, I'm just going to scroll down so we have some more room. So we'll have total assets um, over total equity. Our total assets are just going to be these three uh, top values here added together since these are our assets. And then for equity, we're going to need to um, derive that based on the amount of liabilities we have since we're not given equity. So we'll add up our assets and subtract out our liabilities, and then that'll give us our, uh, our equity so we can solve the problem. So pulling that, uh, 
those numbers in now, we've got assets of that 342,999. Um, add the other two line items in, gives us just under 603,000. Liabilities of that 100,000 plus the about 309,000 gives us just under 409, um, which means our equity is going to be these the assets minus the liabilities. So we've got 193,897. Um, so for our final answer then, we're going to be taking total assets, 602,795, divided by equity, which is the uh, asset minus liabilities. Um, and we'll pull that answer in here, and we see we get 3.1088, and we can round that up to 3.11, or answer B. Question 57. One year ago, Malls Hem Incorporated bought a corporate bond for $1,000 and classified it as available for sale. It collected $50 in coupons, and the bond is now worth $1,040. So we've got a lot of numbers going on here. It's now worth 140. We bought it for 1,000. Received a coupon of 50. On its balance sheet, Malzhem Incorporated most likely should show for this bond the value of. Um, so key here is going to be that available for sale classification. So for available for sale securities, we're showing um, the bonds at fair value. So we're going to be putting what it's now worth of $1,040. Um, so we will go with answer B. If the bond was held or was classified as um, held to maturity, for example, that's when we would start to incorporate that coupon payment and we would uh, end up getting a different answer. But under available for sale, we're uh, holding at fair value. Question 58. Thin Motor paid $459 million to acquire Car Wash, whose net fair value amounted to $387 million. If Thin Motors reports under IFRS and Car Wash reports under U.S. GAAP, how should Thin Motor account for the balance amount? Um, so we've got what we paid here, that $459 million, and we basically paid over by $72 million. Um, as the fair value amounted to 387. So under both IFRS and GAAP, um, this is a bit of a red herring here, kind of saying that uh, one reports under IFR IFRS, one under GAAP. Um, this is going to be recorded as an intangible asset called goodwill. And that's essentially because this uh, premium that Finn Motor is paying it's kind of assumed that they're overpaying for a reason because they should derive some um, economic value um, for uh, over just that fair value amount. So let's look at our answers here. A, 72 million recorded to Goodwill. That sounds like it will be our answer. Let's take a look at B and C though. B, 72 million to be transferred to the capital reserve. There'd be uh, nothing to transfer to a reserve here since we're overpaying. Uh, if anything, there'd be a deficit um, to be accounted for. And then C, $72 million to be transferred to the revaluation surplus account. This isn't related to acquisitions. The revaluation surplus account is used under IFRS to record increases um, in the fair value of fixed assets over their carrying amount. So we'll stick with A, $72 million going to Goodwill. Question 59. Given the following information about Alchemy in millions of U.S. dollars, we've got some financial information here. Let's read the question before we dig into that, though. Which of the following statements is most likely correct? The solvency of Alchemy improved in 2015 because the debt-to-equity ratio increased. Uh, B. The solvency of Alchemy improved in 2015 because the debt-to-equity ratio decreased. Or C, the solvency of Alchemy deteriorated in 2015 because the debt-to-equity ratio increased. So um, if the debt-to-equity ratio is increasing, that's meaning that we're either having more debt, since that's the numerator, pull in this formula, pull in formula. So total debt-to-equity is our debt-to-equity ratio. So if total debt is increasing or total equity is decreasing, that's going to lead to this ratio um, increasing. 
And solvency is basically um, measuring our assets versus our liabilities. And so if our debt to equity ratio is increasing, our solvency will never be improving. Um, so we can go ahead and cross off A right away. B, are con B and C are consistent. So we basically need to determine whether the debt to equity ratio decreased or increased, which will have a direct effect on the solvency. So um, let's pull in what we have here. So we've got total debt over equity. Um, so we're going to be taking basically all our debts for 2014. So short-term borrowings, long-term interest-bearing debt, and um, current position of long-term interest-bearing debt. So these are going to be our three uh, liabilities that we're going to be adding up in our numerator. And then we're going to be dividing that by equity, which is just given as uh, total shareholders equity. So for 2014, we've got a debt to equity of 1.1053. 2015, add these three number, those three same numbers up just for the 2015, and then divide it by the 24,000 equity number. Um, so we've got 3,000 plus 16,000 over uh, plus 4,200 over 24,000 gives us a debt to equity ratio of 0.9667. So our debt to equity ratio did decrease, uh, which means that our solvency improved. So we will go with B. Question 60. You are given the following information about DIA Incorporated. So we've got our financial information here. Let's take a look at the question before we dig in to the numbers. Uh, DIA's tax burden ratio and interest burden ratio are respectively closest to. Um, so we've got two ratios we need to find here. Tax burden ratio um, is going to be net income over earnings before taxes. And then our interest burden ratio is going to be interest before taxes over EBIT, which is interest before earnings before interest and taxes. And so just thinking about this um, logically, the tax burden ratio is essentially trying to measure um, the impact of taxes. And so we're going to be taking net income, which is our purest number, and then we're basically for EBT, earnings before taxes, we're just adding back the taxes. Um, so the, dividing those two numbers basically gives us all the information um, minus or plus the taxes. And then kind of same thing for EBIT. So EBIT is going to be everything in EBT except we're adding the interest in. Um, so it gives us information there about what the interest burden is. Um, so pulling in the tax burden numbers first, so we've got that net income, 634000 over EBT of 723000 gives us 0.8769, so we can round that up to 0.88. Um, so from there, we know it can either be answer B or answer C. We can cross off A. Uh, and then we'll pull in our interest burden ratio. Interest burden ratio is that 723 again for EBT, divided by um, 1,064,000, gives us 0.6795, uh, which is rounded up to 0.68. So we can go with answer C.